Get up. Stop.
No way. You just counted that as a stroke, you bastard. Oh, that's a complete bullshit ripoff. Complete bullshit ripoff. Turn. Turn. Mm. That sucks. Touch the ball and it cost me a stroke. That really sucks. That kind of pisses me off a little bit. Yep, there's a pure crappy flaw. I didn't even barely, I don't even think that ball moved a half an inch and it cost me a stroke. Yeah, that's shitty. That's where you should be allowed one mulligan for when mistakes like that happen. It's like a game flaw, not a player flaw. That is not deserved. That is not deserved at all. Oh man, that's a bugger. shot after bad shot. It's amazing how you can get angry about a, a glitch that screws you on a shot and then you're just beat, beat after that.
I need to get one back. I'm so ripped. Feel completely ripped off. Ah. I can't draw the ball today. Come on. Jeez. Too much spin on E6 connect with the medium, or maybe they call it moderate green. The firmness is medium and that's way too much backspin. That was a nine iron and that's, that's too much backspin. That's crazy. Oh, 
Oh no, that was all uphill. Oh, that was a bad putt. For me personally, E6 Connect, I feel like my wedges are short and I hit some shitty shots. But, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, hard to tell. I feel it's off anyway. Could, could very well be me. But the distances are, are off compared to my real game outdoors. can't seem to get that uphill putt figured out how many extra feet that is. There's a birdie back here. Right now I'm better at losing birdies than I am making them. Get there. Oh no. Yeah, I got that one off the toe. I lost some lost some power there. Just touch off the toe.
You think those would release a little bit more than that? I mean, I feel like the distances are off. I know there's a big elevation there, but I kind of feel like the calculation was pretty close. It's hard to tell. Now we got this snappy one. good on the par threes today, that's for sure. Yeah. It's a nice course, I've never played this one before. I mean, not online or anything. Solid for him. fly this one past the flag because spin is a problem on only six here. Thank <laughs> you. 
slicey. Touch a pole on it. three of them like that short all about the same distance too Draw that one in there and I have to get all of it and just stay straight.
really quite short holes. Blue tees, I think these are, and it just, of course, feels short. Oh man, I'm gonna quit hitting that club here anyway. Get down. Get in the bunker. where I wanted to land it in the fringe slow it down. Get over. 
I didn't even look at that on the mini map to <laughs> make sure that was going to carry. <clears throat> near hard enough. God, that was all downhill. Oh, that was a mistake. Darn it, what a waste. Kick right. Oh, so close. That was going to be a good shot. I thought the wind would push it more than that.
Because they're such skinny fairways. I need to find a club that will find one. Oh, not that one. That was a pure slice. Man. Get out of the water. for driving club swinging way too hard. Just burned the right edge. Oh man, that's a perfect putt.
stop. Stop. Man. Drivers are all slicing. Driver is not the shot today. Good shot. I hit in like four holes.
mound. I played for a big fade, and I just kind of pulled it and hit it straight. Yep, it's just a big pull. Well, we got lucky, but the driver is broken today. mad slices, trying to correct it and pulling everything now. bounce forward. Come on, it's right on the lip. Come on. I bring them to the front of the room good.
Don't go in the tree. Come on, draw. Come on. <laughs> oh, I had the wrong club for that. Huh. Yeah. The jury's still out on whether the distances are accurate in E6 versus what they are in my real life, anyway. Save, you can make a putt. That's nice.
Oh, you dirty dog. Just trying to hit it light with this in between the clubs. So I know there's a few of you guys that were curious on carry distances for the normalized numbers off of GC Quad versus uh, Connect. So I thought I would try to play a round and show you what they look like. <clears throat> so what I find is my wedges the short irons seem to be very close for a carry distance. Long irons are off the chart, hybrids off the chart. This normalized 230 on the quad, 260 on connect. That one's about 10 yards out. Thank you. 
one was pretty close. 280 carry versus I haven't really played a lot of rounds with um, with the wind or live penalties, so kind of new for me right now. under that. Turn a bit. Oh, I really hit that light thinking it was going to carry more than that. That's a big discrepancy. I think find the hybrids. That was a three hybrid. I'm trying to pick the right club uh, before I hit it. Obviously, I picked a four hybrid because three's not in there. 
but that one had a big discrepancy and I find hybrids and my three my four iron have the biggest differences between carry distance from the normalized number on quad versus E6 connect. <coughs> Pot City now. I don't know why I couldn't get any one of those other ones to even come close. Man, that hurt. was a seven iron, so that wasn't too bad. 179 versus 181. Tighten up a bit there.
that tree. Oh, no. That's gonna hurt. That was a wild pull with the driver. Stop! Oh, I needed that to stay there. Nice fade at the flag if it doesn't spin too much. Stop, didn't hit it.
That's good. Oh, it's miles too far. There's a 15 yard discrepancy on that gap wedge there from the normalized number. I had the wind helping. Tried to hit 120. <laughs> I think I hit it 130. That was a mistake. Kind of making this a lot of hard work here. I was right in the center of the cup. All right. All right. What a waste. Uh, pushed right pitching wedge. One of those deals. But I am 
to the right side of the pin there, I might have been able to hold that one. This is not a normal thing with the quad disconnecting. Oh, the first three were good strikes. <laughs> Shoot. Sit down. I don't know what happened there, a little disconnection. That just rolled right over the hole and didn't even make a noise, did it? I was walking that one in thinking it was dead center.
Get in the bunker. <laughs> that was just lazy. Shoot. Well, that was a sloppy hole, wasn't it? It was really unfortunate. up on that ball. Spin back. Whoa, I hit that one way too hard. For you guys that just saw that, I wasn't even anywhere near the ball, and it took a stroke for me. So naturally, the only time I'll ever use a mulligan is when that happens, and I don't know how that happened. Not getting any birdie. No birdies, just par round. A few good chances, and that's about it. Chunky one. I was just trying to stay way away from that water so I didn't fall hook anything into the water. <clears throat> Got it a little bit fat.
Another one I forgot to hit. I was going to hit a big sweeping draw and I just stabbed the toe into the mat. There goes my couple strokes there. Didn't need that on the 17 pole.
not going to come back. See, that's a big 7 iron. That's every now and then what frustrates me with uh, the software. Let's hit a 211 yard 7 iron. Missed that one completely for a big old slicey fade. Just missed, missed the hit. Oh, come on, spin back. Oh, you dirty bugger.
spin. Get it. Be good.
Stop. Stop. Come on. E6, guys, you know that's not right. feet and I think I got 60.
Go. You know, I think I'm getting ripped off. Ball speed 160, club head 112, and it only carries whatever that was, 255, 260. I think there's a, a distance rip off going on here. See, that's that's wrong. I carried an eight iron, 190 yards, and no, no way. Yeah, that's so wrong. <laughs> that was gonna be a great shot.
Get up. spin that was it and it spun right off the entire green. Enough to take the wind out of your sails. draw out of that one. Kind of hit off the toe a little bit too. Back to back movies.
Yeah, I deserve that. that not go in. That was a wrong one. I think that hit the front and the back of the cup.
it had to go 13 feet, I thought.
shit. Oh man, did I miss it that? So from time to time I get a couple questions on the channel of what does my simulator bay look like on the inside. A lot of the videos I post um, you can pretty much just see me hitting a golf ball and obviously um, a bit of the screen, the impact screen itself. So I thought I would take everyone around today and kind of go through uh, an in-depth detail look at what I did to uh, build my own uh, golf simulator bay. And I'll go through some of the products that I used, um, the hitting mat, the, the projectors, the hitting screen itself. I'll put a link in the description below for, um, for you guys that are interested in the particular products. If I don't go into enough detail for some of the items that I have in my uh, simulator bay here, please feel free to comment below and uh, I'll get back to you with some information or I'll do an extended detailed video on one of the particular items that uh, might be a higher request. So right off the bat, I thought I would start with my uh, impact screen itself. And uh, I went with a slightly bigger impact screen than what some of you guys uh, out there might have room for. But uh, to give you a bit of an idea of the simulator bay of the room that I'm using, I'm using, um, basically it's just shy of a two car garage, a separate standalone building that I built in my backyard um, uh, here in, um, in Australia. So basically what I have is a 20 foot wide by 20 foot long enclosure and I have about 13, 13 and a half feet of ceiling height room. So with that in mind, that gives me plenty of room for swinging drivers of all lengths. Um, I've had a few people come in here and hit 48 inch drivers with more than enough room to not have to think about uh, hitting a wall, tagging a roof beam or whatever it might be. So plenty of room for that. Um, for that type of work. But uh, what it did allow me to do is I get the option to put quite a big screen. Um, what I have for a screen is, uh, for dimensions, is I have a 14 and a half foot wide screen by nine feet tall. And uh, I did build my own um, frame for the, for the screen itself. And we'll get you a little closer. And I'll take a, a quick look at what the screen looked like. See if we can get some good light and so basically I've uh, built a metal frame for my screen and I'll put a, a, a picture on the video and I'll edit the video and I'll get you guys a bit of a description of what it actually looks like but um, I used 50 mil by 50 mil RSH square tubing to build my entire frame for this um, for this simulator project and if you guys are noticing right off the bat, I don't have curtains or ceiling baffles. So I know that um, depending on your skill level, that's something that you might be interested in. Um, and all depends on who you have golfing in your simulator bay. But honestly, for my use and for what I do, I don't hit the walls and don't hit the roof at all either. So what you can see if I stand back the frame of my simulator screen here I have about a one meter little ceiling roof on it and give you a bit of an idea and on that uh, ceiling that jets out about one meter I put um, just your normal acoustic panels off of Amazon um, I think it was about $35 for 20 panels and I covered that all and they're one inch thick. I've heard lots of people comment that those acoustic panels, they're not thick enough, etc. Um, for my use, every now and then I'll bounce flop shots purposely off the top of that roof. 
I have no problems at all. They, they bounce, they don't hit hard. It is plywood underneath there. Um, they bounce off the uh, acoustic panel and they hit directly into the screen and bounce right back to my feet. Um, no issues, no loud bangs. Uh, the one meter jet out on the actual screen itself was more than enough for any flop shots. And again, for the dimensions of my simulator bay, to give you a bit of an idea, from my screen to the center of my hitting area is 10 feet. From the side wall, left or right, doesn't matter, um, 10 feet to my hitting area. So again, I have a 20 meter, or sorry, 20 foot by 20 foot room and I have my hitting area exactly in the center of 10 by 10. So plenty of room, plenty of space. And with that one meter height ceiling that I have here, any type of flop shot, or I've had uh, a couple of friends, colleagues, um, sky uh, a driver or a three wood, and it catches, uh, catches the ball each and every time. So just a little food for thought for some of you guys that are out there thinking about uh, building your own um, simulator bait. Uh, it's a huge cost. And depending if you're going to do your own um, sewing, your own tailoring, buying the material and sewing up your own curtains, but it's, it's quite a significant cost to get big, long, black, heavy duty canvas type curtains on the sides and then also baffles or foam mats or whatever it might be up on the ceiling. So it gives you a bit of an idea on how I set up my simulator and uh, I guess the main reason behind not actually having the curtains on the side is as you can see I have a workbench for some uh, uh, tools of the trade here on the side and right behind the camera I also have a shelf full of uh, kind of Rubbermaid totes with your typical Christmas Easter decorations boxes of junk basically stuff that gets used once a year and stored away and uh, I did have to use what we call here in Australia a shed or this garage um, I did have to use it kind of as a multi-purpose room it wasn't a dedicated simulator bay even though that's basically what I use it for but a little bit of storage goes a long way on the actual um, room itself so that gives you an idea on some of the multi-purposing that I did have here and up on top of that um, one meter jet out on the ceiling here um, there's room for storage so up above on top of my simulator screen I got about a meter 1.2 meters of room um, just for storing some light stuff. So I put some boxes of uh, light, you know, again, there's some Christmas decorations and boxes. There's some boxes of shafts and some older golf clubs, some garden tools that I have up there um, that I don't normally use. So I have that stuff stored up there. And what I've done to combat some of the deflection is uh, I went down to a local um, pool shop or you can go to your Home Depot uh, Bunnings, Lowe's, whatever it might be, and I've bought um, some foam wrap. It's actually for insulating a pipe, plumbing pipe. So I've taken the foam wrap and uh, sliced it down the side. And basically, what I do is I cover the steel frame on my simulator screen, and I use your standard bungees, and I bungee around here, and um, any shot, any deflection of a golf ball off the side of the steel frame no ricochets uh, occur at that time so that's why we got the foam wrapping around the frame itself and uh, again I don't remember anybody ever hitting the frame um, hitting the, the foam pieces I'm sure it may have happened but uh, anyway it deadens the ball quite uh, quite a bit and and takes away a lot of the the additional drama or risk that you might have of deflection of golf balls so I'm going to just bring the camera back here and apologize for my camera work but um, it's a one man band here today so to go through some of the specs on the screen the screen itself I'm using an SQ T0 transformer impact screen and again my dimensions that I have 14 feet wide 9 feet tall um, a screen like this uh, for this dimension, and it's all sold by, uh, by the foot, but uh, this particular screen and everything, if I uh, mention any kind of uh, values or prices for any of the pieces, they're always going to be in US dollars. So my screen, a 14 by 9 impact screen, uh, $875 roughly is what I uh, paid for this screen. And uh, I bought it from Part of Pro uh, out of Canada, actually. 
So partypro.com, I'll put the link in the description below. And basically this is their best high-end screen that they have and the quality is behind it. Super quiet, low bounce back, um, custom sizes available. And just based on how you're gonna mount your screen to your frame, etc., you get the options for grommets, um, different type of materials. There's Velcro strapping that you can add to it because it's custom. And it is classified as their high definition screen. And obviously you guys can see that, um, that it's white. And one really nice feature, and I haven't actually tried it yet, but one nice feature of this particular material, it is washable, machine washable. Um, for the physical size of it, I'm not really sure how I would tackle that just yet, but I've had this screen for well over two years now, and um, as you can see, it's, it's not dirty. Again, pretty important to make sure you got clean golf clubs, uh, clean golf balls. Um, I make sure anybody that comes into the simulator bay doesn't have uh, golf balls with uh, markers or any lines or any kind of initials written on the golf balls because that will scuff the screen. But um, great feature that it is washable. And you'll hear a lot of people talk about impact screens where they've got archery netting in front or they'll have foam behind it or archery netting behind it as a backup. If you get a good triple layer quality screen, you don't need any of that. And if we get up to the screen itself, you can feel the thickness of the screen. It's not foam lined or nothing like that. It's basically uh, three layers is what the screen is uh, made up of. And uh, the GC quad that I use for a launch monitor has um, a ball, a number of hits that you, how many balls that you hit it, that it tracks through the GC quad. And I'm on this particular screen up around the mid 30,000 range, closer to 38,000 uh, ball strikes into the screen. And um, a lot of people will give you advice that you wanna use a, a particular golf ball. Strixon comes to mind that uh, Strixon are not as hard on impact screens and uh, when you get to spin, they're, they're a little bit of a harder shell so they don't scuff up and you don't get marks that really carve up the ball. Um, I use whatever golf ball I choose. Um, I let anybody use whatever golf ball. Again, just with a couple um, caveats around that is they don't have marks on them and they're not uh, all scuffed from sidewalks or anything like that. But it is important to know that your golf balls, because you hit them a lot more in a simulator bay than you do on a driving range, or that I do on a driving range, because I'll lose a golf ball long before I wear one out. But uh, here in the simulator bay, I wear out golf balls quite frequently. And the importance behind um, changing your golf ball is once you start wearing that white to now finish off that golf ball it gets rough and the amount of spin that you can generate on some of your wedges it will chew up your screen a lot quicker but um, prior to the video here I've had a close look at my screen and you might be able to see there's a couple um, dirty marks because the golf balls do get a little bit dirty bouncing on the ground here but uh, nothing that's terrible nothing that's affecting the picture by no means but no significant wear marks on the screen. Actually, in fact, there's really no wear marks at all on the screen, surprisingly or not. I had a really good close look uh, this morning, and that screen is holding up really well. And again, close to that 40,000 um, um, strikes onto that map. So um, I'll post, uh, post a, a picture in the video, I'll edit it in, and uh, give you a look at how the screen is, uh, how the frame itself is built out of that square steel tubing. Again, you can use round tubing, you can do it yourself if uh, you have some do-it-yourselfer skills versus going and building one. Um, I'm sure if you guys are located in the US or some of you that might be in Europe, you have access to a few companies that will have these um, frames that are more cost effective if you just buy the kind of kit right off the shelf. But again, because mine was custom sized for my particular space, it was really important to me to uh, build it myself finish it up and um, having the one meter roof on the top was pretty important. Uh, all the steel and the welding labor that it took to put it together, and again, I got a, a local welder to basically build the, the corners where I can insert the pipe over top of the stand and everything's pinned together so it is removable quite easy and I can take it to uh, a new location uh, if I ever move someday. Um, all together, the materials and the labor for the little bit of welding that I did do about $245 roughly to build that frame. So that gives a bit of an idea of what I've got done to uh, the frame itself. So having said that, we're gonna, I'm gonna relocate my camera here. And we'll have a look at, we'll have a look at my hitting mat.
so a quick look at the hitting mat. And I think um, the importance around the hitting mat, it's, it's good to stress that, in my opinion, the hitting mat itself is the heart of your golf simulated bay. Um, again, only my opinion, but uh, extremely important that you get a high quality hitting mat. And uh, to get something on the cheaper side, something that might be at your local uh, driving range, that's fine to get going and get started and uh, um, get you kind of hitting some golf balls and then as you progress through your simulator bay, you upgrade some of the bits and pieces, uh, that's perfectly fine. But uh, if you're gonna spend any good money in a simulator bay, the hitting mat, in my opinion, is by far the best investment. So the one that I went with, um, and I tried quite a few prior to this, and the particular model that I went with was the uh, Fiberbuilt, the 9x4 Studio Center Hitting Mat um, from Fiberbuilt. Um, it is a Canadian company, um, free delivery everywhere in North America, US and Canada. Um, I did have mine shipped across the world, so I had a bit of a cost in the shipping on that, that side of things. But why the Fiberbuilt mat? Um, I tried quite a few different hitting mats. The, the, the main piece of the Fiberbuilt was the how it lasts, the longevity of the actual mat. It can take a lot of abuse and what this thing is rated for, I'm obviously nowhere near the hitting at this point, but roughly 300,000 strikes. And as you can see, I'm only hitting golf balls off that center piece. And this center piece is for individual kind of puzzle pieces basically. And uh, what's nice about that is when you do finally get to a high number of strikes in one of the sections that you're constantly hitting from, you can rearrange the puzzle pieces and um, get a fresh new piece of grass and not have to replace the entire strip. So in, in my mind, um, yeah, you're going to get a lot of strikes out of this. Um, it is a fluffy bristle, this, the impact of the hitting area, it is a fluffy bristle so you can hit down on your golf ball. And it's very, very good for just general practice around um, hit it. If you're uh, a fat striker, if you hit a lot of fat shots, this will give you instant feedback because your golf club will get down into those bristles and when you hit a fat shot, just like on the golf course if you're playing on a good fairway, you will be punished by that fat shot. So, um, extremely good quality. Um, the stance mat here on the side, obviously uh, we have the center striking area. So um, this is set up for left and right and again my, um, my hitting mat is dead center of my room here. So lefties and righties can come in here and swing away with any length of club without any issues. Um, I never hit off of this type of mat. I'm not sure how this one would hold up, but I just use it for standing on. And um, excellent for uh, tennis elbow, anybody that's got any kind of injuries. And uh, just going from the driving ranges over the years and going multiple times a week, I developed kind of a nasty case of tennis elbow from your normal uh, I would call it one inch thick, uh, cheaper driving range mats and uh, hitting down on the golf ball and taking that impact into your wrists and into your elbows, I'm definitely going to feel the pain. So I um, highly recommend the fiber built hitting mat. And uh, some people might say that um, putting off of this is a bit of a, a challenge and it's not as realistic or the ball is going to hop and bounce. I don't find that at all actually. And I'm going to turn the camera around and give you an idea of what the, the rest of the floor and the rest of the, the matting that I have around my fiber built uh, hitting mat here looks like. And uh, when I play online, whether it's uh, Foresight Sports, FSX 2020, or E6 Connect, all of my putts, I make normal everyday putts and they roll straight out across into my screen without any bouncing or hopping and it works really quite well. But uh, in order to do that, it's important that you have a really good base. So let's rearrange the camera here and I'll see if I can get a, a good look at what the base looks like. So basically what I've done is I've put underneath my artificial turf, and we'll have a look here first, is sections. So this section here is about a one meter. This one's actually cut a little lighter than one meter, but it is the interlocking gym mats. So this is a premium interlocking gym mat. And I actually don't really take these apart that often. So again, I'll put the link in the description for the mat um, just down below. But uh, I gotta go back to my sheet here because there's a lot of specs that I can't remember all of them. But basically what this is is a premium gym mat. Um, 
used in mixed martial arts studios, wrestling rings, uh, etc. It is uh, tested and proven to the soft standards for 1.2 meter critical fall. And another useful bit of information here is uh, the density is about 105 kgs for this cubic meter here. So um, it's definitely hard. It doesn't squash down when you're walking on it. Um, if you do get a heavy guy on it, it will kind of push down, press in, but it doesn't uh, take time to expand back. It's a good solid gym mat, and you guys have seen these in the Olympics. You've seen these on TV, um, wrestling rings, popular gyms that you may attend to. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea on the size, again, it's one meter by one meter, and the thickness, 30, uh, 36 millimeters uh, in thickness. And I went with this particular mat just for the density and the ball coming off my screen, hitting the mat with the turf on top, completely deadens the ball. It's nice and quiet. It just drops straight down off my screen and onto the artificial turf. Um, why I had to go with such a thickness piece of mat is because of this fiber built. The way the fiber built cage is set up, it is uh, about an inch and a half off the ground. So once I've put this gym mat into place, down again. Then I have my artificial putting turf that's about 19 millimeters in thickness and what that does is gives me a perfect perfect level smooth surface right up to my fiber built hitting mat. So, um, And as you can see I've kind of built the gym matting and my artificial putting turf around the hitting mat itself because the hitting mat is only nine, uh, nine feet wide. So um, I built it into the actual grass section itself and um, it's level with the screen sitting on top so if you do hit a couple of those worm burner shots it'll basically go right along the turf and roll up the screen instead of under the screen so gives you a bit of an idea again for the hitting turf itself or the putting turf I should say I'll put the link in the description below um, for you guys in North America I'm sure there's a lot of options um, this is more for uh, my particular area here in Australia, but uh, there's a lot of uh, turf options out there and a lot of companies. I guess the important piece when you're looking for a turf or if you're trying to match it up to your hitting surface, um, in my case I spent a lot of time researching trying to find the right gym mat to get the right thickness and then once I got a thickness that was pretty manageable, now I had to work off the thickness of the actual putting turf itself and getting that 36 mil thickness of gym mat with a 19 mil thickness of artificial putting turf gave me a perfectly flat smooth area onto my uh, fiber built um, studio mat. So just a little uh, information there and something to think about if you want a nice smooth putting surface and you're using a, a mat similar to mine like this fiber built. Again there's a lot of good options out there for hitting mats but the, the one I went with was the fiber built. So. Uh, that should uh, wrap up this section that I'm going to do. I'm going to do this in a couple parts, probably all in one video. But I'm going to stop the video and I'll put uh, some information on the products that we just talked about. And uh, we'll continue on with the next one. So for the next part of this video, we're going to take a look at um, some of the electronics that I use in this uh, Simbe and uh, probably one of the most in, next most important parts is lighting, good lighting. Um, obviously in the sim bay you can tell that it's quite bright right now and I just have your uh, normal everyday lights that are on and uh, we'll have a look at some of the spot lighting that I have and some of the additional uh, Elgato lights that I have for when I'm actually videotaping and uh, doing some dark work and uh, videotaping some of the rounds that I do that I post on YouTube. So right off the bat, let's have a quick look at our spot lighting that we have up on the ceiling. So I have five ceiling mount, obviously on separate switches, but uh, those are individual spot lights. And um, again, link in the description below so you can see some of the detail in the up close pictures and what they actually look like. But to give you an idea, each one of those lights have a disc and that disc is allowed to be rotated and you can uh, change the aperture of each one of those lights. So basically you can, you can change the, the size of the spotlight itself 
to from a large circle and uh, I think there's about four settings on it all the way down to kind of a pinpoint si style setting and the way the lights are set up is they're crisscrossed basically on an X pattern so that the light doesn't shine in my eyes while I'm standing on the golf mat in the hitting bay here and uh, I never get blinded through the follow through of the swing or any of the above so very uh, very good lights those were bought direct off of eBay they've came from came out of China um, great lights affordable they're 20 watts I went with the warm white so that uh, you kind of get that yellow light instead of the fluorescence uh, a lot of fluorescent lights can cause issues for some of the launch monitors out there so warm white um, gives you uh, a nice light and again they're on individual switches so I can turn them all on or individuals themselves and then you can also see at the very top uh, under the center light I have uh, a microphone um, that microphone is uh, from MXL it's an MXL AC 404 conference USB mic and that conference USB mic is the mic that I use and again it's on the center of the ceiling um, it's the mic that I use for any of the videos I don't have external mics I'm not using uh, webcams um, that mic is tied directly into OBS and that's the mic I can just sit around and chat and talk and it works perfectly fine for what I use it for so uh, great mic it is a conference um, uh, microphone USB um, typically it would sit in a big large boardroom in the center of the boardroom table and away you go from there so I uh, highly recommend that mic uh, if anybody's looking for something that's uh, more suitable for their needs but uh, a couple other things that I'll quickly touch on and uh, these lights here are from Elgato um, those are the the key lights and I have one on this side have a quick look and again the Elgato light um, excellent you can change the color of the light you can go from a warm white to a, a fluorescent uh, the brightness you can change so I have one on each side of the hitting bay um, I don't use them all the time for just normal everyday golf it gives you an idea there's one on a tripod over there and uh, they both come on stands and they both come with basically a tripod that amount to a, a desk a shelf whatever you might want and um, I only use them basically if I'm um, playing around a golf in low light such as what I have in the bay here uh, where I want the cameras to pick up a, a better picture so if I'm going to videotape around basically is the only time I use those uh, Elgato lights and they are controlled with an app whether it's on on the computer or on iPhone in my case I just use it right off the iPhone so it gives you a bit of an idea what I have for lighting otherwise uh, the rest of the lights that I do use are just your normal LED lights uh, four foot uh, LEDs that I put up in this space and that's what we're using primarily today to give us uh, good good lighting come back here and I'll just take a little shot of our our projector so it gives you a bit of an idea where my projector is mounted so it is um, somewhat of a two-car garage again um, transformed into my simulator bay but the distance of where my projector is it's, it's really quite high and you can see with me standing here uh, it's probably getting close to that 12 foot mark it's about 12 feet in the air and it's all the way to the back of the garage wall so it's about 18 feet going to the to the screen itself so it is classified as a short throw and I've got this projector through a, a few recommendations from other people that have already um, built their simulator base so this is the Panasonic DZ585N and I went with this one just because it was a, a lower cost still a great high definition it's a 1920 by 1200 the 1610 aspect ratio and why that's important is so when you see my screen my impact screen I have the picture go all the way down to the grass putting surface um, it was important to me to have that I didn't want the black bars on a typical 1920 by 1080p uh, aspect ratio uh, that 16 by 9 aspect sorry I didn't want the, the black bars at the top and the bottom so I went with the 16 by 10 just to get the picture stretched out all the way across and again that Panasonic is a short throw uh, projector um, in the US they're roughly 15 to 1700 dollars for that particular projector 
Um, you would call it somewhat of a smart projector. It has a lot of great options, um, mirroring iPhones and tablets, um, just different things such as that. Um, I don't use any of those features. I turn it on and I have my PC plugged into it and I use it for simulator golf. And uh, from time to time, when we're having a backyard get together, I'll leave the, the roller door open um, in the evening, put a movie on on the big screen, put some lawn chairs out here and let the kids come in here and watch a kids movie while uh, we're out in the backyard um, having a bit of a, a family gathering. So it gives you a bit of an idea. Again, link in the description below for the projector and uh, I'll put some of the throw distances for this particular projector. Again, I've never had any issues with it. The picture's great. Um, today, with the, all the lights in the, in the shed lit up here, um, it might look a little washed out, but uh, typically when I'm playing golf, um, I have zero complaints with the, the screen itself on the impact screen. The picture, it's, it's absolutely perfect for what you need, and uh, the price is still uh, somewhat manageable and affordable. Which, uh, which was extremely important to me when you're starting to get all these pieces and they start adding up in a heck of a hurry. So that's a bit on the projector. We'll have a quick look at um, a few of the other things I have. So I have a little kind of a rolly, roller trolley on wheels here meant for an iPad. Again, picked it up uh, off of eBay, this little trolley. It's adjustable height. Um, adjustable angles for the, the table and the mouse pad itself. Um, I picked that up on eBay for about $30 roughly, um, somewhere in that area, $25, $30. I use just a wireless mouse and keyboard and that's going to my PC that's actually behind me and um, that's I control all my my software, my sim software, um, Plex, whatever, YouTube, uh, it all comes off this. Um, nice to have uh, a touch monitor, but for my environment here, a touch screen doesn't really work. So a touch screen is, is not very useful for what I have for an environment. So again, here's a little 360 view. I got my server case up there with my computer in it. And again, like I said, the shelf that's in the corner, it is uh, doubled down as, as a, a shed or a garage. So I needed to justify to uh, my wife that I can use the shed for other things other than just golf and realistically I'm getting away with it because I'm only using it for storing a few boxes. Um, I had an old whiteboard that I uh, threw up and I hung on the, the steel shelf here and I put a few shafts and a few different things that we mess around with. I've got some three wood hybrid and driver shafts on here. I've got a couple fitting irons on here with different shafts. Typically when I get a new set of irons I'll always buy an extra six iron. And then I'll set up the six iron for um, a, using my um, fitting shafts on so I can mess around with it a little bit and see if there's something better when I, uh, a better shaft suited for the irons that I chose for the new year. Um, some nice toolbox area that I have a few, few uh, club mechanics tools on. So you're, you're basically your measuring station for clubs, for cutting clubs or just measuring clubs themselves. I have the... Um, the golf mechanic auditor here, swing weight scale, sitting in the corner. We can have a look at that at another day. Um, my computer, I put in a, in kind of a media center case, just so that I could fit it into the server case itself. So we've got the basically a, a custom built computer in here, and uh, all very high end specs for high end gaming. And I chose the high-end specs for the PC itself, uh, video card and processor, because I like using the, obviously the simulator software at the highest graphics. But when you start using things like Swing Catalyst at the same time as your launch monitor, you start chewing all, a lot of that uh, CPU um, processing power up. Um, so basically, my Swing Catalyst is running off of the processor itself and uh, my simulator software is uh, using the graphics card so I've split them up like that to um, reduce any potential issues that we might have. I've got a, a Samsung QLED 75, I think that's a 75 inch TV and uh, we have that set up on here. Right now it's playing an old round of the Masters but um, typically I'll put the Swing Catalyst software on this particular screen up here so that I can see it. And again, it's on, a, it's on a TV mount so we can spin it whatever direction we want. 
get it to kind of get the, the golfer more immersed into the actual screen. And so we can bring this little guy out. And um, I'll put some of the, the club data, some of the analytics and the club data coming off the GC quad through FSX 2020 software. I'll have the impact position of the golf ball and the club face data, etc., on this particular screen, and um, or vice versa, and swing catalyst up here on this particular screen. So, so we've got a few monitors inside of the sim bay here. Again, nothing that's absolutely required, but um, but they're there. They're there for anybody's use. So, gives you a bit of an idea of what we're what we have set up. Um, finishing the walk around tour here. I do use uh, Stream Deck from Elgato, and I've got a lot of pre-programmed buttons on the Stream Deck for cheering and clapping and um, putts that are missed. It's more just for having fun when uh, we're playing around to golf with some colleagues and friends and somebody makes a great shot, I push a button and the crowd cheers and everybody's happy and it's just for fun more than anything. Uh, in the far corner here, a very important, uh, you gotta have a ball washer, a uh, ball and club washer, so I've got that mounted on the wall and when I come back from playing outside on the course, I'll just come here and run my clubs through that uh, ball washer to get them all clean so I'm not leaving any ugly marks on my screens anywhere. Uh, what else? We'll have a quick look and uh, if anybody wants any information, I have a golf mechanic bench mounted uh, gripping station as well as um, the two spool for the grip tape from uh, golf mechanics as well down here. So I really enjoy the Golf uh, Mechanics um, products, tools of the trade, make a good quality product for a very fair price. So over on this side of the bay, we have the Golf Mechanics Precision uh, Shaft Puller. And this is uh, one of the, uh, I guess I would call it the best shaft puller that Golf Mechanics make. They've got probably four or five different models. And uh, that would be the, the best of the best that particular one. If anybody's interested on uh, getting any information or wanting a little bit of a review on that, happy to do that. And then we have the Golf Mechanics uh, shaft prepping station back there. And we have the loft lie machine from Golf Mechanics as well. That one's uh, pretty much the granddaddy of all the models that they have. So um, at the, the point of this video, they don't make a better one than this particular model that I have here, all digital. And then we have the frequency analyzer in the corner here. And that's, um, I use that uh, when I do start putting a new shaft in a driver of mine or any of the above. So. so that gives you a bit of an idea of what I have for a simulator bay. And obviously uh, all powered by the Foresight Sports GC Quad. So I think that wraps it up in a nutshell. Again, if there's anything that anybody's looking for for information on any of the products that we talked about, feel free to reach out in the comment section below and uh, I'll see if I can provide you guys with some uh, feedback or some more information. And again, a few things that we may have skipped over. There is a video that I've done recently on the FLIR cameras that I have um, powering off of a swing catalyst. So I've got one mounted here for a beat down the line. And then just over my gripping station, we have the second one for right-handed face-on. And there you have it. Again, if you've made it through the entire video, thanks for watching. I appreciate uh, everybody tuning in. And um, please subscribe. Um, if you guys are out there watching the entire videos and you're subscribing and these videos are helpful for you, I'll continue to make them. Everybody's got a busy life, so uh, if these are not adding anybody any value and no one's watching them, obviously we're going to quit building these videos. But so far, so good. So I appreciate everybody tuning in. Thanks for everything, and um, please subscribe.